Hello, and welcome to the final part of our Auto Battler tutorial. In this video, we're going to put the finishing touches on our Auto Battler game. By the time we're through, we'll have all the basic mechanics of our Vampire Survivors style game completed, but the game will be far from finished. Feel free to take what we've created here and extend it, change it, or add to it whatever you like in order to make it your own. My name is Adam, also known as Drummer Who Codes. Be sure to give this video a like and subscribe to my channel. If you're ready, we'll jump back into the game. The first thing we're going to do is organize our code. As we continue adding features, it will get more difficult to find the events that we're looking for. You can create a comment by right-clicking and selecting Comment from the drop-down menu. We'll add a comment for Collision, one for Enemy Behavior, and one more for Player Attack. Drag the comments to the correct positions, and drag the At the Beginning of the Scene event all the way to the top. Having this event at the top isn't necessary, but I like having it at the top so it's easy to find. Now we're going to add a little polish to our game to make it feel a little bit more satisfying to the player. The first thing that we'll do in this regard is to add some sound effects, which is really quite easy. For this one, we're going to create a new event under Player Attack. For the condition, select player. Then the fire a bullet behavior lets us select a condition called player has just fired. Add an action to the event and select play a sound. By this point, you've probably realized that we don't have any sound effects created. That's okay, GDevelop has us covered. The software comes included with a free synthesizer called JFXR that is perfectly suited for creating lo-fi sound effects. Let's click the Create with JFXR button. Don't know how to use a synthesizer? GDevelop has us covered there too. Look for the panel on the left that says Create New Sound. Let's click the Laser Shoot option. Every time you click the button, it randomly generates a shooting sound. Just keep clicking until you hear one you like. JFXR also saves all the sounds that you audition, so you can go back to an older one if you like. I think I like this sound. Name the sound, and click Save. We'll set the volume to 50, which is half volume. And finally, we can set the pitch. Playing the exact same sound can get a little bit monotonous, especially as fast as we're going to be firing, so it would help to vary the pitch a bit. Do you remember the random in range function that we used to calculate the enemy spawn position in the last video? We can use a similar function to randomly alter the pitch of our shooting sound. The function that we're going to use this time is called random float in range. Don't forget the parentheses at the end. In computer terms, a float refers to a floating point number, which is just a decimal number. A whole number is referred to as an integer. We want to select a random decimal number between 0.1 and 1, so we'll pass those values to the function as arguments. Hit OK. Now hit Preview. And everything works great. Next, we'll add a sound for when the enemy gets hit by a bullet. I'll speed through this part, but we'll use essentially the same steps that we used for the bullet sound. And finally, we'll add a sound when the player gets hit by an enemy. For this one, we'll add a sub-event to the enemy player collision event. The health and damage behavior gives us a new condition that we'll use called health has just been damaged. For this event, we'll add several actions as we want a few different things to happen simultaneously. We want to play a sound when the player gets hurt, and we also want to add a knockback to the player. You should know how to add a sound by now. We'll use JFXR just as we did with the last two sounds. To add a knockback, we'll add a force to the player. We want the player to move away from the enemy when he takes a hit. To do that, we'll select Add a Force to Move Toward an Object with a permanent force of negative 200 pixels. By selecting a negative value, we will ensure that the player moves away from the enemy object, 
and by adding this as a sub-event to the enemy player collision, we will ensure that the specific instance of the enemy object that we move away from is the one that just collided with the player object. Finally, we don't want the player to move away from the enemy forever, so we'll wait for a tenth of a second, then stop all forces on the player. Now let's hit preview. Next, we're going to work on the animations. First, we'll add a walking animation to the player object. Let's create a new comment called player animation and add a new event with the condition player is moving. For the action, we'll put change the animation by name and under animation name, select the move animation that is included in the dinosaur that we downloaded from the asset store. Now create a new event and also set it to player is moving, but click on the switch that says invert condition. This is going to make the event trigger when the player is not moving. For the action, select change animation by name again, but this time choose the idle animation. And hit preview. The next thing we're going to do is to add a health bar to the player. Thankfully, GDevelop has a built-in solution for that. This one's going to be a little bit different as it isn't an object behavior, but rather an extension that we add to the game globally. Click the project manager at the top left of the window. Click on create or search for new extensions and search for the resource bar continuous extension before adding it to the project. Next, we'll add it to the project as an object. Click on add new object, then make sure that you're adding a new object from scratch and select Resource Bar Continuous from the menu. Pick a design you like. Uh, it doesn't matter very much which one, but I'm going to select the red flat bar. Be sure to rename it and set the initial value and maximum value to 100 each, which is going to be our maximum number of health points. Hit Apply. While we're at it, we'll add an Experience Point bar that we'll use later. I'll make this one blue. Rename it and set the initial and maximum values to 0 and 100, respectively. Click Apply and drag a health bar into the scene under the player object. Hit Preview. You'll notice that the health bar doesn't work yet. Not only that, but it's also kind of large and it stays locked into one place on the screen. We'll fix those issues one at a time from the Events tab. Under the At the Beginning of the Scene condition, we'll add an event to scale the health bar on the x-axis to 0.5. This means that the height will remain the same, but the width will be one half its original size. To make it follow the player, we'll add an event without a condition, which means that it will run every frame. In this event, we'll set the health bar's position to the player's x position minus 50 pixels, and the player's Y position plus 50 pixels. I had to try some different values to come up with these numbers and you might have to do the same. Don't be afraid to experiment, but be sure to tie the health bar to the player object's position unless you specifically want the health bar to stay at a certain position on the screen. Now let's make the health bar work. Find the enemy player collision event and add a sub event with no condition. Select the health bar object and choose value. The next part is a little bit weird. Set the sign to equals, then type player.health colon colon health and an empty parentheses. This will select the health and damage behavior and then retrieve the health points value. We'll do a more in-depth explanation of this command in a future video, but it isn't necessary to have a full understanding of it just yet. Hit preview and it works. Now for the experience bar. We'll go ahead and add it to the very top of the screen. Now go to the enemy object and click the variables tag. You probably know what a variable is, especially if you studied algebra in school, and a variable in computer programming is very similar. We'll think of a variable as a container holding a value that can change. The health points from the health and damage behavior, for instance, is a variable. It holds a value that represents the health of the object, and it changes when that object takes damage. 
Click the Add a Variable button. We'll call this one XP value. Variables can be one of several different types, but this one will be a number variable. Set it to 25 and click Apply. Next, go into the player object and add two number variables called XP and Level. Set them to 0 and 1, respectively. Click Apply and go back to the Events tab and add an action to the Enemy Death event. Select the Player object and Change Number Value. Set the XP variable to add the enemy's XP value. The way that you get a variable from an object is to type the name of the object, followed by a dot, then the word variable capitalized, then the name of the variable in parentheses. Click Apply. In the same event, we're going to set the XP bar to update pretty much like we did with the health bar. Remember, for the value, we're going to use an object variable, so we will type player.variable, then XP in parentheses. Finally, we want to include a condition that will level up the player. We'll add this as its own event under a new comment called XP system. For the condition, we want to check if the XP bar is full. Then we'll add three actions. The first one to add one to the player's level variable. Another to change the player's XP variable to zero. And one more to set the value of the XP bar equal to the player's XP variable. Let's see it in action. Everything seems to be working as planned. The last thing we'll do is give our player a new weapon upgrade when they hit level 2. Let's add a new condition to check if our player has hit level 2. Create an event, select player, then number variable. We'll check the level variable is equal to the number 2. For the action, we'll select the player object again, then select bullets per shot, and we'll set it equal to 3. Hit Preview. And when we hit level 2, we gain a triple shot weapon upgrade. At this point, our game is far from finished as there are many, many features that we could add. For instance, we could add more weapon upgrades, more enemies, um, scaling difficulty, even entirely new weapons. There are also some quality of life improvements that we could add, such as displaying the player's level on the screen, um, adding menus, a pause system, or making the camera follow the player around so we can explore more than just the screen that we start on. All of that being said, I'm pretty happy with moving on to a different topic for now. However, I want you to take this game that we've created and experiment with it and make it your own. The best way to learn is by doing, so take this idea and expand upon it. Change the graphics, add features, do whatever you like, and if there's anything specific you'd like to see from this game, leave me a comment below and I may revisit it in the future. This series is the first of many that I'm going to produce. I have a huge list of topics that I want to cover and game tutorials that I want to create, so this is only the beginning. Leave me a comment if you want to see me cover anything specific, such as a type of game, a particular game, a game mechanic, or if there are any specific questions you have regarding game dev or coding in general, and I'll see if I can cover them in a future video. And be sure to send me a link to any projects that you create. I would love to see them. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.